All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, rotation, talking, introducing the concept of angular momentum. Um, so examples of applications of angular momentum conservation, of uh, angular momentum, or angular momentum conservation. Um, this explains a lot of phenomena. So here you can see a picture of a helicopter. And um, the, the helicopter to try to uh, rotate, um, the heli angular momentum is the rotational analog of linear momentum. So by default, the helicopter would want to rotate um, but it, because it's, pro because it's propeller is rotating, um, but then it has a small rotor on the tail so that it does not, um, so that the whole entire helicopter does not begin rotating. So we're going to start with wheels and rolling. Um, so the way you want a wheel to act is that you want the wheel not to slip. The wheel actually stays, it does not slip relative to the, um, the surface it's on if it's, go, if it's behaving correctly. And it's the rolling that moves something forward. It's not slipping, but it's rolling in most cases. Um, so then it's actually the friction with the road that keeps things going well. Um, so here, um, on in the right hand side, you can see that a rolling wheel appears blurred by its motion, but actually near the bottom, it is not as blurry because the wheel is roughly stationary. The, and when at the exact point of contact, it's stationary. So it's instantaneously at rest. Okay, so then what actually goes on when you have rolling? Um, so you have a few different forces on the wheel. You may have some force which, um, which is causing the wheel to rotate. Um, you have the gravitational force, um, which acts on the center of mass. For things like bicycle wheels and car wheels, this is roughly, you can put this roughly in the center of the, um, of the wheel because it's roughly uniform. You have the normal force of the road on uh, on the wheel, and you have a frictional force, which is actually keeping the wheel from slipping. Um, so, if you have wheels rolling without slipping, the um, the center of mass is moving forward. But at any given point, at the point P um, labeled right here, the wheel is not in fact slipping. Um, so then you have an angular acceleration and an angular, um, you have an angular acceleration and, and an angular velocity. And these can be related to the linear acceleration of the center of mass of the wheel and the linear velocity of the center of the mass of the wheel with these equations right here. So all that is saying is that um, the, the angular velocity is the radians per second that the object is rotating um, with and the arc length um, for a given angle of radians is the rate is the number of um, is the number is the number of radians times the radius of the um, of the circle. So that gives you the total amount traveled, and then the time derivative of that is actually. Let me go ahead and write this on the screen. Um, so if you have some arc length for a segment along a circle. You have some angle theta here and a radius r. The arc length is r times theta. And then when you're talking about rolling motion, that's the amount of distance the wheel will have rolled along the um, along the road. So that's the amount it will have rolled here. 
So the S, the T, in that in the case of rolling without slipping, is equal to the velocity or the magnitude of the velocity. So the time derivative, for instance, in the x direction, if you put your x coordinate um, along the ground. And then if you take the derivative of r times theta, the radius of the wheel is constant. So you have r d theta dt. So this is the same thing as r omega. And you can take the second time derivative. So the second derivative of the arc length is going to be equal to the acceleration or dx squared dt squared. And that is going to be equal to r times the second derivative of theta with respect to time, which is just the angular acceleration. So that is where these equations come from. And then you can look at any given point. So if you are rolling forward, um, as you are rolling forward, the point P has an instep. I want my spotlight. Point P has an instantaneous velocity, which is actually backwards because the wheel is rotating clockwise if you are going forward. And this is just saying some of the stuff that I was saying um, in different equations. The arc length um, is your rolling. The arc length is um, giving you the distance, is related to the distance traveled. It's telling you how far the center of mass has moved. So now you have rolling without slipping, going down an inclined plane. And now this is your free body diagram. I have mixed feelings about this. So the way that I always um, have graded free body diagrams is to view them as a tool for solving the problem. So I am never nitpicky with my students about how exactly the free body diagram is drawn um, and where the, the forces are <clears throat> because it's a tool. Now, if you are not my student, you may have different an instructor with different, um, different standards. Um, here, when you're talking about rolling, the, the location where you have the force, the force where the forces act does actually matter some somewhat. Um, here, I would actually just say, well, the weight is straight down and they've broken it here into its two components using our favored coordinate system for an inclined plane. Um, the normal force, now friction does act right here. Um, it does act at the bottom of the wheel. It only acts at one point. Um, the normal force I could pick, it's hard to tell really what the way that they've drawn this. The normal force also acts exactly at that point. Um, and they've drawn it acting on the center of mass. It acts at the point of contact. Um, but you still um, only have those three forces. And what's happening is that friction is keeping the wheel from slipping. So it is actually rolling. But because it's rolling, you have to consider the energy that the rolling takes away. You have to consider rotation as well as translational motion. You have to consider the energy that the rolling takes away 
from uh, the translational motion. This is, uh, this is for a wheel, which is um, in the left, it's just the wheel with it. Well, this, is, this slide is for rolling and slipping. In the left, it's saying, okay, now you're just flat. Let's not worry about the inclined plane yet. Um, and you still have the exact same forces, except note that your friction is kinetic friction. And here, you no longer have these equations hold. So you no longer have angular velocity directly related to linear velocity um, and angular acceleration directly related to linear acceleration because um, you have some, because you are no longer, the arc length is no longer related to the distance traveled. The distance traveled can be more or less than the, um, than the arc length. So for instance, if you are driving, um, if you are driving on ice, you may not be moving very, moving anywhere at all. So you have to consider things slightly differently. Now, just like what we had in the previous, don't freeze up, just like what we had in the previous chapter, when you have rolling, you can get, you have, write a net torque, you write a net force equation, and that tells you everything you know to move for, need to know to move forward, and then you just have to be meticulous in how you work out all of the equations. Okay, so this is if you have rolling with slipping down an inclined plane, same thing as if you are rolling um, as if you are rolling on a level ground. Um, and the th thing that's different from when you're rolling without slipping is that you no longer have, uh, you can no longer tell me what the angular acceleration and velocity are from the, um, from the, All right, so now we're going to introduce the concept of angular momentum. So angular momentum is the anal rotational analog of linear momentum. Angular momentum is the moment arm, the cross product of the moment arm with the, um, with the momentum. So here, if you have a particle rotating, here you have the moment arm. This can also be the point on a wheel to give you the direction. And then if you are rotating counterclockwise, the momentum of that, the tip of that wheel is the arrow P shown there. So in this case, R crossed with P is going to be out of the board or towards me. So the angular momentum is there, pointing out towards you um, as you look at it. So angular momentum, just like linear momentum, has a direction. Now what's, what can be a little confusing is that the angular momentum vector is not in the same plane as whatever is rotating. <clears throat> OK, so. R, if you have some vector R cross P is the angular momentum. Now, you can define the angular momentum even if you don't explicitly have relative to some axis of rotation. It's always relative to a certain axis of rotation. You can define it even if you don't have something rotating. So a common simple exercise is here's a bunch of point particles, just calculate the angular momentum relative to the origin you can do it. It's not necessarily meaningful, but it's a good exercise to make sure you understand the concept of angular moment. Um, so our solar system was coalesced from a gap, cloud of gas and dust that was originally rotating. And because angular momentum is conserved, 
they continue to rotate in the same way that they, in the same direction they originally were rotating in, um, which is pretty cool. So angular momentum, another application. What's rotating tends to keep rotating unless you, unless you apply a torque to stop it. Okay, and here's a very simple exercise. You can do R cross V and get the angular momentum of a proton rotating, for instance, in a cyclotron. In this case, the angular momentum is going to be out of the board pointing towards you. <clears throat> The magnitude of the angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. So this is, again, an analog to linear momentum. For linear momentum, we have that the linear momentum is the mass times the velocity. Um, so angular momentum is the analog of linear momentum. Moment of inertia is the analog of the mass. Angular velocity is the analog of velocity, and the equations have exactly the same form. So the moment of inertia is a measure of how hard it is to get something rotating. And the moment of inertia is the mass, if for a point particle, the mass times the radius squared. For a collection of particles, it is the masses times the radii squared. And for um, if you have some continuous object like a person, you would just you would have to convert that sum into an integral. You would do a density as a function of the radii um, from the axis of rotation and you would integrate over the, the whole volume. So it's going to be a triple integral. Um, so in the case, it, generally, if, some, if mass is further from the axis of rotation, it's harder to get it rotating. If mass is closer to the axis of rotation, it is easier to get it rotating. So the, if further from the uh, axis of rotation, the moment of inertia is larger. Closer, it is smaller. So if you have an ice skater, because the moment of inertia is, um, because the, the ice skater, when the ice skater pulls in her arms, the moment of inertia gets, uh, of the ice skater decreases. So the, that means that the angular velocity has to increase to compensate. So this is a lovely case where you don't need to know the details. You don't need to know her exact moment of inertia in order to figure out how what she does qualitatively. Um, when she rotates, when she pulls her arms in, um, she is going to start spinning faster. I used to be able to do this a few decades ago. I cannot not ice skate any longer. It was a skill I had as a child. Okay, so here is a gory, the, det the gory details. If you had to calculate a moment of inertia of a complicated body, you are going to take some little chunk of that body. So look at a very small chunk of mass and find its position from the axis of rotation. Note that you don't care where it is on that axis, just how far it is from the axis. And you integrate over the, um, you're going to integrate over the whole object so that you're taking the mass average of this to get the moment of inertia. Now in this class, calculus is a co-requisite, not a prerequisite. So we're not really gonna, if I'm, I'm introducing these concepts because I think that it is useful for you to have seen it. Um, but, and if you already know the calculus, this is gonna make a lot of sense, but if you haven't had the calculus, that's okay. Um, all right. So then you have a few other applications. So now you have a top spinning 
when you have a top spinning, there is actually a torque. Um, so because the, the gravity, there's gravity acting on the center of the mass of mass of the top, um, gravity is going to apply a torque. <clears throat> so in this case, R cross F is going to give you a torque into the board, the way this is drawn. It is going to cause a rotation about the Z axis. So when you have a spinning top, you have rotation about the center, um, but because the top is not fixed to the Z axis, um, it is going to uh, experience a torque from the center of mass tipping over, pulling it, pulling it off to one side. Um, and then it is going to, that the gravity is going to cause that the tip of the to top to rotate while the, to the top itself rotates. This is called precession. Um, and this is because the, this shows it a, a little bit larger. So, you're from the at the rotation about the axis of the top you have the angular momentum drawn right here and the top is rotating with an angular velocity like this and then this center of mass so you're now going to this torque is going to cause a rotation about um a rotation like this so that's why this is the moment arm um because the because gravity is trying to cause a rotation like that, but it can't because angular momentum is conserved. So R cross F is going to be into the board in that particular case, which is kind of hard to draw. Um, so I give them a little bit of leeway. So when the top is is here along the um, lined up along the y-axis, the torque is into the board. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw what happens if we are looking at the other side. I'm going to use the same color coding for their forces so I don't have to relabel them too carefully. All right, and then <clears throat> you would still have R cross F and it is out of the board. And looking down along the x, y plane, you are going to have torques where the, the torque actually changes depending on where you are. And the torque is the change in the angular momentum. Just like the force is the change, is the time, the force is the time derivative of the linear momentum. The torque is the time derivative of the angular momentum. So that's these, um, the torques here are telling you what is happening as the, um, as the top turns around. It is going to process because depending on where it is in the x, y, where this piece is in the x, y plane, it is going to experience a different torque. This is always confusing at first. Um, take advantage of your labs, and um, and this is an order. I want you to play with the equipment, play with it. Um, there's nothing you can do to help you understand this stuff better than buying your own little gyroscope. There's a lot of cool ones out there. You can even 3D print a gyroscope or a top. They're lovely. Okay. So another common, a common physics demonstration that we use is um, rotating a bicycle wheel. Um, so you get it spinning. Um, and once you have it spinning, you are going to try to move, rotate yourself and spin the wheel. And what you're going to see is if you are trying to, or sorry, in this case, she's trying to 
push the wheel down and rotate it so that it would rotate like that. R cross F leads to this torque. And in the other direction, R cross F is going to lead to, uh, let's see, sorry, nope. R cross F on both directions is going to lead to the same torque. Either way, it's going to go to the same to the same torque. So it's going to try to rotate the angular. Um, she's trying to push it down, but the bike wheel responds by rotating like this. It's always very cool if you can get um, if you can get a chance to play with one of the physics demonstrations. You can actually feel it doing this, or if you get your own little gyroscope you can feel how it resists um, you rotating it. it. That's the conservation of angular momentum. And when you push in one direction, it's going to rotate in a different direction. It's counterintuitive at first. So this is why the best thing that you can do to, make your, to help yourself with this material is to play. All right, and we're gonna see how many examples I can get through before I lose childcare. Um, so here, uh, a yo-yo can be thought of as a solid cylinder of mass M and radius R that has a light string wrapped around it. One end of the string is held in, fixed in space. If the cylinder unwinds, if the cylinder falls as it unwinds without slipping, what is the acceleration of the cylinder? Okay, so here we're gonna have a net torque and we're gonna have a net force. And we need to write both of those equations to figure out what's going on. The net force is equal to, um, we're going to use standard coordinates, x, y. So when I do this, I'm going to put the tension in the y, positive y direction and gravity in the negative y direction. Um, and this is going to equal m a y hat. And here I'm going to let a be positive if acceleration is upwards and negative if acceleration is downwards. Now I can calculate the torque. The force of gravity does not apply a torque on yo yo because the force of gravity acts on the center of mass. So the only thing, so when we have the torque goes like R cross F, and when we have a moment arm, which is zero, as it is the case for the center of gravity, the, net to the torque from that force is zero. So now I'm going to have R cross the tension. So I have R T and um, R cross T is going to be out of the board towards me. And that is, is in the Z direction. So I've got a Z hat right there. And this, if I have angular acceleration counterclockwise, by convention, that is um, a positive alpha. This is going to equal I alpha. So I have I alpha. And here I'm going to move my label for the y axis for readability. I alpha z hat. Okay, and now because we have no slipping. A equals R alpha. So I can write this as uh, I A over R Z hat. All right, so now I'm going to just take the, magn the magnitudes on either sides of these equations because I do not need the vectors are all, you can think of the vectors and the unit vectors as like 
algebraic vari variables they can just cancel out and I get T minus MG equals MA and RT equals I A over R or T from this equation T equals I over R squared A. Now I like this formulation because I has units of mass times radius squared. So when I see it like this, I can see that the I over R squared has the correct units. Um, so here I can write I over R squared A minus mg equals m a and I can solve for this I can solve for a and I get a I'm going to skip a few steps here um, a is going to equal ah actually I'm going to do a few more things just divide by m everywhere. And then I'm going to put, I can swap A and G. I'm going to add A to both sides, or add G to both sides and subtract A from both sides. And I get A equals G over I A G over I over M R squared minus one. So in the case that you have a moment of inertia of zero, we take the massless pulley, um, the, the massless pulley approximation gives us that the acceleration is simply negative, um, is simply negative g. Anytime you have a moment of inertia, it is going to decrease that acceleration. It's going to slow down the yo-yo. I like this example because it's one of the most straightforward examples where you have to consider the torque and the force at the same time. All right, this one, rolling with slipping, or sorry, without slipping. Um, the fact that it is rolling without slipping is gonna tell us that V equals R omega and A equals R alpha. Um, so we get those two equations because we do not have slipping. Um, now we need our net torque and our net force. The net force is long. Let me rearrange some of my zoom windows. So I am going to use the same. Um, notice that I am usually writing the coordinate system down before I get too deep in. Um, so I'm going to use my standard coordinate system. The net force is equal to negative friction in the x hat direction, uh, negative g in the y hat direction, positive the normal force in the y hat direction, and then F, I'm going to just call this guy theta, cosine theta x hat plus F sine theta y hat. Okay, I can actually break this out into, oh, and this is equal to M 
A, and this is in the X direction because the um, we're going to assume that it's not pulling the wheel up off the ground, which the um, problem doesn't explicitly state, but that's a reasonable assumption. Okay, so then we actually have two equations from that negative fs plus f cosine theta equals ma those are the x coordinates and negative mg <clears throat> plus n plus f sine theta equals zero. All right. Our, this is asking for the maximum value of f. I'm going to write the torque. Now, the normal force cross, the cross product of the normal force with the moment arm is zero. Um, because they are parallel. Those two vectors are parallel. The torque due to gravity is zero because it acts on the center of mass. And you are told that the force F is applied to the center of, wheel, of the wheel. So its moment arm is also zero. So it also applies no torque. So then the only force that applies a torque is friction. Uh, I need my right-handed coordinate system, which means that Z is pointing out of the board. So my torque is R cross F is into the board. So it is a negative Z. So it's negative I alpha Z hat. And it is going to be equal. The, the frictional force, the frictional force and the um, moment arm are perpendicular. So this is going to be equal to F S R. And then because we have no slipping, I can write this as I over R A. Oh, and this I have to, I have to have my Z hat here. So then, I have three equations. I'm going to box my three equations. Here I can cross out the unit vectors. And I have three unknowns. My three unknown, uh, let's see, I can write a maximum. Uh, I need four, I need one more equation because you're told what is the maximum value of, um, your frictional force you can replace with mu sub s N. All right. And then we have unknowns. We don't know A. We don't know F. We don't know N, and we don't know FS. But we have four equations and four unknowns, so we can solve it exactly. And the rest is left as an exercise for the reader. OK, so this is one of those examples where you can de you determine the moment of uh, 
the angular momentum. So here, I am going to go, we'll just put the equation on the board. Angular momentum is R cross P. This is R, R cross P is into the board. And they're exactly perpendicular. So the magnitude is two times M1 times V1. Um, for our next one, R is here and it is parallel to the velocity. So R cross P is zero. Here, R is there. It is parallel again to the momentum. So it is zero. And here, this is our R. R cross P is out of the board towards me. And then um, the perpendicular component of R, the part of, the, of R perpendicular to the velocity is three. So L has, has a magnitude of three times M three times V three. And that's it. It's good to be able to do it to do a simple example like that. All right. Now here, a particle of mass m is dropped at the point d negative v zero and falls vertically into Earth's gravitational field. So now what we're going to do is start by writing the position vector of that particle as a function of time. So we have a equals negative m g y hat. I have a strong preference for x hat, y hat, z hat. Um, so, and we're assuming, and we start at, um, we have v zero equals zero and um, y zero equals zero. Um, so, we have the position vector is a function of time. It is always going to be at negative d x hat. And then it is going to be negative 1 half g t squared y hat. OK, so that's our position vector. Um, and we also call this r sometimes. And the velocity vector is going to be negative g t y hat. And now we need r cross p, which is r cross uh, r m r cross v. So I have I'm going to put my m there and um, the y component of the position vector crossed with the velocity is always going to be zero because y hat crossed with y hat is zero but the x hat cross y hat is z hat so I am going to have the magnitude, so I'm going to have D, G, T, Z hat, and it's going to be out of the board. Um, and then you can calculate the torque. So torque is the time derivative of angular momentum. So you can take that expression and take the time derivative, which is m g m d g z hat. But you can also use r cross 
f in this case. So if you have not had calculus, the, the time derivative is might be a little harder. For, well, depending on where you are in calculus, you probably know how to do a basic derivative now. So maybe you can do it. Um, we can also do r cross f. Um, in this case, f is negative mg y hat. Um, so again, y hat cross y hat is zero. So we only need x hat cross y hat is z hat. And we get mg d z hat. So whether we do it using the time derivative of the angular momentum or r cross f, we get the same answer. Yay! We want to be able to get the same answer in two different ways. OK. Is the torque equal to the time rate of change of angular momentum? It is. And then this is a lovely example. Um, so here we have uh, an Earth satellite. Um, apogee and perigee just mean different um, points in its um, in its orbit. So now we have angular momentum is conserved. So we're going to use L equals m v r um, or L one. Mass doesn't change. So. Then we are given its speed and um, its radius at the apogee. So we can calculate, and we're given its um, speed, or sorry, we're given its radius at its perigee. So the speed at its perigee is going to equal the speed at the apogee times the radius at its apogee over its radius at the perigee. And that's it. And with that, ah, let's, we're going to skip those examples. And with that, we're going to end this take of chapter 11.